Evening, everybody. I will give it a couple more minutes for a few more people to join before I get going. Um, but do help me feel less weird and lonely talking to the screen and pop a little hello in the chat. And if you wanna, if you have any questions and you didn't get to ask before, pop them in there. Um, if you also, you could let me know that you can hear me, that would be helpful. I shall await. Oh, yes, Nadia says hello. Thanks, Nadia. That's helpful to know that you can all hear me. That's good. Hi, Karen. Good to see you guys. So I shall I shall leave it one more minute and then I'll get going proper. Uh, hello, Melissa. Good, good. You can hear loud and clear. That's excellent. Excellent. Karen says, yes, love the poster behind me. Strategically positioned here. Um, yeah, this is my new office because I've recently moved and this was a lovely gift. Um, for those who can't see, it says, into the ocean I go to lose my mind and find my soul, which is kind of how I feel about it. Um, um, I kind of talk a little bit about that later. So it's, yeah, it's great to see you guys. I will, yeah, I'll, I'll start maybe about, it may be a few minutes time. Um, just, just give it a minute. People to get drinks and stuff. Don't be too prompt. <clears throat> and also, I don't know if, how many of you watched the pre-video of 10 minutes, but I won't repeat everything that's in there. I think what I'll probably do is I've made notes of people's questions, so I've got them here, and I'll go through the pre-questions that I've had, and then well, in, interrupt me as well. Please feel free to put some questions in the chat, and as they pop up, I'll um, I'll talk to them, and I can switch around the order of these questions, so that's no problem at all. Um, yeah, so I'll give it a couple more minutes. So if anyone who's already here has a question that you didn't get to ask, do you just in advance, then do you just pop it in the chat. Or I can ask that. I think most questions that I've asked will probably cover most um, most people's queries and stuff. But we'll see. We shall see. And I've got a couple of questions from my nephews as well, who are 13, 13 today, in fact. Happy birthday to Edward. I think he's gonna watch later on record, so I thought I'd I better say that happy birthday message. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of questions for my nephews. Yeah, 13 and 10 they are. So I'll answer them too. Um, the question, the initial question, <laughs> which didn't make much sense for my youngest nephew was, have you, ever, have you ever been eaten by a shark? Quite clearly not. But then he did ask another question about sharks. So I shall answer that for him later. So hello, Alexander later um so who do we have jen saying hello hello to jen and uh hello to laura as well hello hello everybody thank you for joining i was just saying i'm gonna give it one more minute and then i'll then i'll just get going um yes nadia i'm glad i haven't been eaten by a shark as well although i did meet a very interesting man when i was on the way on a flight uh from um i believe i was going from San Diego to LA in uh, October last year and I, a guy sat next to me I noticed he had a prosthetic limb and I didn't ask about it but we started talking and I think we got on to talking about diving and he was uh, grew up in Hawaii and he was a bodyboarder and he did actually he was uh, on, on top of the water and he actually lost his other leg to a tiger shark but it just made him really fascinated by them and want to learn more about them so that, he was a really interesting chap um and then he became like a, he became a, a surfer, um, despite that disability that he had. So he's pretty impressive as well. Much more impressive than me. <laughs> I definitely can't surf. <clears throat> All right, so I'll get going. So hello, everybody. It's good. It's good. Good of you to join. So thank you for joining in and thank you to everyone who sent questions. I'm going to go through them all. And um, if you have any, just feel free to interrupt on them in the chat and I will talk to them. So as I said in my intro video, I've been diving for about, I think it's about 15 or 16 years. And I'm a normal recreational diver. I'm not an instructor, I'm not an expert or anything like that. But I think it's sometimes more relatable to hear from people who do it as a hobby rather than when it's their job and um, 
you know, I can really remember what it was like to be a beginner. So uh, I will talk to some of that as well. And I definitely can remember considering I recently learned to free dive after scuba diving for a long time. And that was a very interesting experience about about being a beginner again. So I can totally relate to people who are either beginners or haven't done it before. In fact, I actually went scuba diving for a day as a rest from free diving because, you know, when you're just trying to learn everything, your mind is trying to remember everything. So, yeah, lots of experienced people tend to say, oh, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. And they're trying to reassure you, but that's all they say. So I thought a bit more detail might help on some of the specifics that you guys have. Um, The first thing that I would say is, as with anything, um, confidence is a result, not a requirement. Uh, a coach I know said that once and that's so true you know you only need to take one teeny little brave step and then the rest come but you definitely you wait till you feel confident to do anything you'll ever do anything um so uh so yeah so the difference between free diving and scuba diving for those that don't know is free diving is diving without all the equipment that you have uh when you're scuba diving so when you scuba you have as per the little people here they have tanks with the air and they uh, have a lot of, um, they have the equipment that holds the tank on and the, the hoses to the mouth. And uh, with freediving, you don't have any of that. You will still have fins on your feet and uh, a mask, but you then hold your breath and that's how you dive. So there's no other apparatus than that. So it's a completely different experience. And uh, the, the number one rule of scuba diving is to not hold your breath which is the exact opposite in free diving. So they're very, very different, um, but very similar levels of um, safety and being sensible in the water and, and all that sort of thing. And, you know, on the note of equipment, I'm not gonna lie, the, the, the thing that I, one of the things I love most about when I jump into the water as a scuba diver is as soon as you're in, all that sort of kit that you've got on your back, you become, you feel weightless and you just become one with you. Whereas when you're on land or on a boat or sort of lugging all about, it, it's very cumbersome. And I believe that's why some free divers really enjoy free diving because they, they don't have that, they just jump in. Um, lots of people also say you prefer one or the other. And I would disagree for me. I'm much more experienced in scuba and I'm very, very much a beginner free diver. Um, but I did really enjoy them both for different reasons. And so the first question my nephew had, Edward, whose birthday is today, he asked me how long did it take to get to the amount of metres that I got to, which when I learned last year, I managed to get to 28 metres deep on one breath. Um, I only didn't go a bit further because I I had a slight um, uh, pain in my ear, which went away, but uh, I was just being cautious. So yes, 28 metres was how far I got down to on one breath and that was after only five half days of training and practice um Laura says it's really impressive yeah it sounds impressive <laughs> but uh, actually the 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 center was so good and the training was so good and you know that's what another thing I want to get across is that it's really really important to be comfortable with the school that you learn with and the and the people and the instructors that you go with um, and you do various exercises when you're free diving. One of them was a static, they what they call static breath hold, which is where you literally just have your head in the pool and you've done some meditation and, and preparation. And it's how long can you hold your breath when you're just literally standing there with your face in the water. Uh, and that was just around three minutes. And um, I really hated that. And most people do apparently. <laughs> uh, but that, that's that's very different to when you actually free dive. Because when you're free diving, you're moving. And when you move, you use oxygen. Your body uses oxygen. So that's another reason when you become very experienced as a scuba diver, you learn to um, propel yourself along with with uh, what we call frog kicks, like a bit like a breaststroke, and you just do long, slow ones, and you try and move the rest of your body <clears throat> as little as possible to try and not use up um, use up your air quickly. But that that all comes with practice. So yeah, I did not like the static free diving, um, but the rest of the other stuff was was good because you you then immersed in the water and you're moving, um, and so that's the answer to 
Edward's question. And he was also asking how much training and practice and it's all about having your mind in the right place. So a lot of the breathing exercises you do with free diving is to um, calm your mind and body and to stay still and to actually lower your heart rate and uh, get yourself into a nice calm place. And it's very important if you start your free dive and you feel that you're not in a calm place, uh, you come back up. And I did that quite a few times. And there's no rush. It's just the important thing is to enjoy it and feel the sensations. So that's for Edward. And uh, there's, so I've got other questions here, just looking down at those. Um, the other thing I would, would say to you all actually is that there are many opinions on everything and um, every, diving included. And again, I'm just one, this is just my experience. Um, people passionate about anything like me will say, for example, why aren't you down here? Why aren't you doing it? It's amazing, you should try it. And I, I do think that, but again, lots of people try and convince you of what's right for them and it's, it's all about you and your enjoyment that's what it is it's supposed to be fun and enjoyable so um there's a lot of variety and lots of people like diving for very different things which leads me on to nicola's question which was why do i love diving so much so as i've indicated by the poster um it's the only place really where i feel really really free in my mind and I was a very nervous beginner. I wanted to learn to scuba dive for a long time. Um, and when I started in the pool, you do a bit of theory and stuff. And then all the skills you have to learn in the pool, it didn't feel natural to me. And with the pool, um, even with a deep pool, you know, you can see where the top is. And when you're new to diving, you're Boy, what they call buoyancy is where moving up and down trying to get that right that's tricky and it you know, feel clunky and I actually felt quite claustrophobic in the pool I felt constrained by it but I managed to do the stuff I just I just really wanted to learn it and at least give it a go and then the, ne the next day when we got into the ocean and I jumped in it felt why well this is completely natural so that was really interesting for me actually I immediately felt more confident in there and I think that's also because the joy was immediate, the kind of, wow, this is amazing. And I learned somewhere really good, and I, I'll come on to that point later, but for me, that really helped fall in love with it very quickly, or to persevere when things were a little bit less comfortable, was because I, I thought, oh, but I, I could do more of that, and that feels really good, or I could see more of that, those things. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that. And I'm also constantly surprised, you know, I've been lucky enough to see many, many things, some incredible, incredible things. You know, last year I saw, I think I put in some of the promo, um, a sighting of a really rare sighting, albino manta ray, so it's an entirely white, and I got some footage of it as well. And, you know, the place where I was staying, the owner, I think he's been there six years and he's never ever seen one. So that that's just luck. And that, that was really, really incredible um but you know i'm still as fascinated by turtles and i've seen loads and loads of them because they're so beautiful and peaceful as well as um developing a very surprising fascination of a few trips ago with sea cucumbers so <laughs> the ones i've seen before are just brown and a bit dull but when i was in the tropics there were loads of different ones that actually saw them moving and they're really quite big. And there were some that looked a bit like stripy candy canes that you get at Christmas. And I just became really fascinated by them, which is to me very bizarre. So I'm, I'm constantly surprised by that. Uh, Laura says, did you learn in this country before going to Egypt? Mentioned your video went diving for the first time. So no, I did not learn in this country. And uh, I've, uh, yeah I've got that uh, question around that later I'll jump to it now though um and it talks a bit to this point the visibility um is is much more difficult in this country in some places and for me and this is again just for me I knew that when conditions are more comfortable when you're a beginner and when you're learning for me especially it was going to be easier to, to deal with some of the other sensations and experiences that are very new and overwhelming, even in a good way. And I want, I, I do not like to be cold. <laughs> that was, that was, that was back then, so 15 years ago. So I thought I will go where it is warm. And I did, I did a lot of research and Egypt was very reasonable. And I went there in September and the water was 28 degrees. 
which was lovely. And the visibility was sort of 25 to 30 meters, which is also, you know, that's how far under the water you can see. And that also makes a difference for me when I was a beginner, because, you know, I could look around and see where the instructor was and I could see further than just the hand in front of my face. And um, I believe I would have been more nervous if I could barely see and that I was cold and shivering and all, all, all the more discomfort would have made it a bit more difficult because I was quite nervous when I started. So, um, so that was that was why I went to, to Egypt to learn. And also, I mean, I got a holiday as well. And, it, and I'll come on to this later, but it can be much better value slash almost cheaper then here when you're starting out um when you are very experienced you know lots of people do enjoy diving in the, the uk because you you know when you're more experienced you have to work harder it's more satisfying when you do find something there can be great visibility you can see some amazing things and i completely accept that and i used to say i would never dive up here because i don't like the cold um but now i'm much more open-minded and i probably will give it a go um but i'm not going to lie I like the warm weather <laughs> and uh, the warm water. And actually there's, you know, when your, your body loses heat and uh, to the environment very much more when you're in the water. So even when the water is warm, the longer you're down, you're, you know, you will get colder and that's all relative. But the, um, but even in warm countries and very warm water, I felt chilly on dives and that just, reaffirmed to me that I, it was going to be a while before I tried a uh, cold dive and you have different equipment you have different wetsuits and there's things called dry suits and all of that so you're, if you're properly equipped in the UK you'd be, you would be fine um, uh, so yeah just things that were putting me off to start with before I learned and then there's lots of wreck diving there's um, very technical diving there's all sorts of stuff and I've recently learned about some of the underwater cities that are there where there's not much marine life because it's all sort of been um, decimated but there's Alexandria in Egypt there's a place called I think uh, Cleopatra's underwater city and it's like all ruins and things like you see above land underneath and I think that sounds really cool so you don't it's not always just about the fish but it usually is for me um Laura says, never heard of a dry suit. How is it different? Well, I've never used one, um, but the basics basics are that it's it's much more sealed um, and, bu and bulkier, and it's to keep you much warmer in very cold water. And I believe it's it's slightly more technical because instead of regulating the the air that helps you go up and down the buoyancy by a device that you strap onto yourself. It's through letting in, uh, you know, changing valves on the suit. So that that's quite different to uh, using a wetsuit and what they call the BCD, which is the buoyancy control device. So you've got like a little waistcoat and that's attached, you know, in a tank of um, air is attached to that. And then you strap that onto yourself. And then when you're inflating or deflating that, that helps you control. The buoyancy but the dry suit is works in a very different way uh to do that but i don't know the i don't know the details and i'm sure lots of people will be able to give advice on that um and nadia says they're weird i used one when snorkeling in iceland yes yes i understand you and again you have to be trained properly to use it so that you're not um in danger so that's that um what's the next question uh, oh, and to the point of being cold, actually, we're not the same people tomorrow as we are today. And certainly, like I said, I'm more open to things now 15 years ago. And I used to say I would never do anything cold. And now I love cold water swimming. And I only tried it to prove that everyone that does it is nuts. <laughs> and I found out that it's great. So, you know, retain an open mind. There's no rush for trying things. You can try whatever you want. Um, and, you know, we do change. So that's. That, that's just um that's interesting now i love the cold water swimming and i wish i didn't because now i'm sort of addicted so karen says a dry suit doesn't let any water in you stay warmer a wetsuit relies on you warming up the water it gets in between you and the suit well yes that's a much better explanation than mine <laughs> so there you are um and nadia says have you done any night diving if so did you enjoy it yes yes i did do a night dive as part of my i think my advanced qualification so i did the open water and the advanced 
almost back to back. Um, they, one of most organizations, they make money from selling you courses and Paddy is who I learned with. And whenever you learn, they'll always try and sell you something. That's how they make their living and that's fine. Um, and they said to us, oh, if you do your advanced as a result of doing this this week, you could have money off. And, and also I was loving it and I was there. So I thought I'll do it. And I'm glad that I did it then. Um, and I think I did a night dive as part of that. And Nadia, I think it was you, if not, it might have been someone else who asked, would I recommend um, doing advanced? And yes, I would. You, you're able to go to a different depth then, which just opens up some of the experiences a bit more for you. Um, uh, but yeah, people are always trying to sell you courses. Oh, you need to do this. You need to do that. You, you must try this. You must try that. I, I don't think I've done any other courses. I'm open-minded to some others, but uh, for me, I've just spent a lot of time in the water now, and that's actually improved my buoyancy and all my experience tenfold. I, I did think I was going to do peak performance buoyancy course because I really wanted to get, really wanted to stay more still and get that working, and, and I didn't. I just practised. Um, so, yeah. Same as everything else. Be on the lookout for everyone trying to sell you something. Uh, but night diving was a great experience. And I recently did one in Egypt again last September. And I actually saw squid and they were doing the, they were luminescing, that thing where they, they, they all were different colours. And, and that was, that was really incredible. So, uh, and I saw giant hermit crabs. I love hermit crabs. And I, you normally see little tiny ones. I saw this big one. And you see everything in a different light. Um, or lack of light. Uh, but it's, you've got torches and yeah. And some, some people don't like it, but again, I, I would, uh, if you're intrigued by it, recommend it. Uh, people look after you just like they do with other dives. Um, and that, that says, yes, it was me. Karen, what's the benefit of staying more, more still? You use less oxygen, which means you are not using your air as much. So in fact, you're, I heard somewhere, and I think this is when I was learned to free dive, that your your brain and your eyes, that, that uses up a, a great deal of, of oxygen. Uh, and when you move, uh, that, that uses up oxygen. So when you have a finite supply of air, that's why you want to be more still. And um, when I was a beginner, you know, you're bobbing up and down, trying to get your buoyancy, and you can sort of and I was doing this a lot, you know, the, the natural instinct is to try and help yourself float by waving your arms and legs about. And so you can normally spot people that are new that way. Um, and then I would get really excited when I'd see things like turtles and, I, and I'd be waving at people. And oh, you know. uh, But now I get excited in a calmer way because I want to stay down for longer. And the, long, the longer your air lasts, the longer your dive lasts. And I went through my logbooks a few weeks ago to look at my air and how long it had lasted and it's all practice and experience and when you're new you want your air to like oh I can't believe you can last for an hour and I've only done 25 minutes and it's just like anything else it can be frustrating um to get better but you will get there you undoubtedly get there you know when you're learning, there's nothing that they haven't seen before. And so people are very kind and give you experience. Experienced people will give you tips and stuff. So that's the benefit of staying more till still. You can stay there for longer. Uh, my other nephew asked, have I seen sharks? What type and how do they behave? So I've seen quite a few sharks, um, not the huge, big, super scary ones yet. Uh, I have seen a, a lot of reef sharks. Uh, so there's white tip reef sharks and um, black tip reef sharks and grey reef sharks are bigger. I've seen quite a lot of those. I've seen what they call carpet sharks or wobegongs, seen quite a lot of those. And then I was lucky enough to be swimming and snorkeling on that as part of a research trip with whale sharks in uh, January earlier this year. So, yes, I've seen quite a, a variety of sharks, um, but, yeah, none of the really huge ones that some people really want to see. Um, how do they behave? Well, again, I, I believe, and I may have, I may, there may be marine biologists on here that completely correct me, and I may have completely remembered this incorrectly, but it's a long time ago. I was diving on the barrier reef, and it's the first time I think I'd seen sharks, and they were explaining that we, uh, because we're warm-blooded, our hearts are 
stronger and, and, and sharks have very poor eyesight and they go on, you know, they sense what's in the water. And so our, the strength of the blood pumping around our, our bodies, it makes us sound to them bigger than we actually are. So reef sharks in particular, because they're, they're smaller, they are generally, like most animals down there, more scared of you than you are of them. And we were advised to, you know, if we were following, not obviously harass the creatures, but follow from a good distance. And if and if they were to sort of turn and look, that's a sign that they they don't really want you there. So it's probably best that you leave them then. Um, so that's how that's how they behaved um, in in that instance. And then other sharks, they do their sharky thing. They sort of glide along and they normally move away from you if they see you. And it's it's quite it's, it's quite good just to watch them from a distance. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm always happy not to get too close, to be honest. Um, but <laughs> I'm not scared of them at the moment. Uh, I did go in Egypt once. We went shark hunting, where we went out not hunting properly, but we went to look for them because it was hammerhead season in the Red Sea. I believe this is in August, and so we went out into what the terminology is out into the blue. So instead of diving along a, a reef wall or, or a wreck, um, you know, we were just, everything with the boat was behind us and we were just going into the blue, the deep ocean. And that was actually very disorienting because you've got nothing to, no reference points of height, which is why it's really important to be aware of your equipment and your gauge um, and to look at how deep you are because that's when it, you can very quickly become disoriented. And that was interesting. We didn't see any hammerheads and I was quite apprehensive about it. I'm quite glad maybe that we didn't see them, but it was a long time ago and I was still a beginner. Um, so yeah, that's the shark question uh, for Alexander. Someone said, what's the best way to get into diving? Uh, reputable school or agency. That's, you know, do your research like you would everything else. Um, you need the confidence to go at your own pace. You know, the diving school, the instructors, they want you to fall in love with it. They love it. They, they want happy customers. So it's important to find uh, an instructors and schools that you click with. And when I booked, I just read reviews, booked online, and then got there and had a great instructor. I've been very lucky most of the time to have really great guides and instructors. Um, and there, there, there's definitely a point about not being too... British about everything and if something doesn't feel right to you uh, to ask you know as a paying customer for something different you know if you think you'll gel with somebody else because this is your experience this is your um, maybe going to be your hobby you spent money and, and if someone's not as patient as you'd like then I would encourage you to to say that you need more patience whether to the person or to the school or if something's not working for you I would encourage you to to let them know but most people with, with beginners are great you know when we were there uh well I wasn't a beginner but there was a boat of beginners next to us and one woman was completely freaking out and I you know but by the end of the week she was in love with diving and loved it so they know how to deal with people that are worried and scared if they're a good and reputable school um so people are also not mind readers <clears throat> so they don't know how you're feeling and there's nothing there's no shame in saying I'm nervous or I, I feel a bit funny about this if they if you don't tell them they won't know they won't want to help you either reassure you or explain how to fix something for you in, in terms of how you're thinking about it so yeah try and be um, try and be assertive so that you can enjoy it um, is there a certification that should have if they're good well there's <clears throat> Uh, the the main schools, you know, the agencies, if you like, Paddy's a famous one. Um, there's um, a specific British one, BUSAC, I think. I may have got the acronym wrong. And then there's SS, SSI as well. Um, so they're the main ones, yeah. Um, and they're, they're recognised everywhere. And, uh, yeah, just do research. Ask people who have been to the places. <clears throat> I would... I would encourage you also to go somewhere. So Thailand is excellent to learn. I expect England is excellent to learn in because of the limited conditions. You know, you have to be more careful. Uh, Egypt is excellent to learn. Australia, 
places where the standards are high, um, in Egypt, for example, that a lot of their tourism depends on it, and they protect their reefs really, really, really strictly. So you are not allowed to wear diving gloves or carry a knife, which divers sometimes do for, for safety. If they got caught on something, they could, you know, cut themselves free. But because they want to protect their reefs so much in Egypt, you're not actually allowed to have a knife or wear gloves because they believe they're wearing gloves, even if it's for cold, encourage people to touch stuff. And I have been to other countries where it's a bit more relaxed and some people are like, that's much better, they're much more chilled out. But when they're not strict, they touch the wildlife, they try and get you to touch the wildlife, they don't they don't cover off things that would make you feel better. So, you know, when you're learning the stricter the better. That's that's what I would I would encourage. Uh Laura says I once looked into learning in Vietnam and there seemed to be lots of acronyms I didn't know which one, which one signified that they were good yeah it's um it can be a bit of a minefield but definitely oh some of my even know isn't that like by now I'll try and help uh, I think diving in Vietnam I haven't been but it's becoming much much more popular there as well um the advantage of going somewhere like that is of course that uh, apart from the diving itself which isn't necessarily expensive when you're on holiday those sort of places are quite cheap so your on land activities are, are cheap compared to maybe somewhere like australia which is fantastic but obviously not at all cheap um yeah so i hope that helps um i just look at my other questions i have here that people submitted before uh let's see um what has been my favourite place to dive? Uh, Egypt's special to me because um, I've spent so much time there. And the reason I spent so much time there was because before the flights changed, and I believe they changed back, before that, you could go get there in five hours. It was quite cheap. The people were lovely. Um, it was a really great setup. There was lots of diving there, and, uh, and the diving was incredible. It's the best, the best closest place that's warm. Um, there, there are some fantastic reefs, a huge variety of marine life, and it isn't far, and it is really, really, really not expensive at all. Um, but I think my favourite, favourite place that I've been is a place called Raja Ampat in Indonesia. And this was a bucket list place for me. I've always wanted to go somewhere that was absolutely world-class diving, as in some of the best sites in the world, because... You know they can take a lot longer to get to and then they can be expensive you know it's when the travel is long and then you want to be there for a long time to make the most of that 36 hour journey <laughs> you know that's when you know your cost mount up like with anything um and, and it was yeah it was it was every bit as amazing we chose a good place and we were so lucky that we chose that place and it was i mean absolutely incredible i had to wait 13 years or something to get there but I read something recently that said if you're not willing to wait a number of years for something how much do you really want it and well, it's an interesting concept frustrating sometimes but there's something great about saving up and the anticipation and, and you know that, that sort of build up and uh, when you're somewhere also for a long time you would find like with anything actually diving every day for five days or ten days by the end of the week your confidence all for ten days confidence has increased massively you feel you've seen great stuff and it's it's like anything else the more regularly you, you do it the more confident and easier it becomes and then each time it's easier again but it was absolutely absolutely amazing i went there i had my 40th birthday there in december and i can't think of a better birthday <laughs> I mean, I've had some great birthdays. Okay, family and friends, before you jump on my WhatsApp and get offended. I've had some amazing birthdays, <laughs> but it, it was it was incredible. And when I was there, I, you know, on my birthday, I saw a flock of uh, eagle rays, like 15 of them going past like a flock of birds. And, it, you know, it's it, this experience was like being in a documentary. Um, the reason I wanted to go to Indonesia is that some of the, that area has got some of the highest concentration, the highest biodiversity um, uh, of reef life. And some of the reefs have actually accounted, they've got the record for the amount of um, a life there, uh, reef life there. And so the variety was absolutely incredible. So that was, that was really good. Um, 
what somebody says. Uh, for free diving, you were talking about meditating. Have you found yourself using the same techniques in normal life or normal life techniques while diving? Um, not the exact same breathing techniques, but definitely the principle of using breath to slow the heart rate down. Again, uh, the great coach, Rich Livin, says you will always benefit from slowing down to speed up and uh, you will always benefit from taking five deep breaths in any situation, whether immediately or when you're thinking about doing something else, you know, trying to slow it down, which is for me really difficult when I get really excited, especially in diving. But this is a concept that you talk to, Karen, where it's exactly like that. You slow down in diving, you'll get more out of it. You'll last, the air will last longer and you can obviously conserve your energy and, you know, then when a turtle comes along, you'll be able to sort of go after it. Uh, <laughs> but definitely the idea of having that still time and to use to use your mind, really, that that's that's what a lot of things come down to, and that's why I found with freediving, is that I didn't do it for a long time, I wanted to do it for years, but I always believed that my mind's too busy, I can't meditate, oh, all these things come in, and I had a wrong idea of what meditation really is as well, which of course is not the absence of thought. Um, but I thought, oh, I'd never be able to do it, and I knew it was about the mind. Because once you've learned the training and you practice the breathing, it, it has to be about the mind, and of course, that's very applicable in normal life as well. Um, most of us, I think there's, there's a really great quote that I put in here for later, but it uh, talks about unhappiness is only really exists when we're not present, so when we're worrying about the future or we're regretting the past, and that's very pertinent for diving, free diving or scuba diving, because if you're worrying about something, you can't get me, or, oh, I'm not going to be able to do it, you know, you're not actually in that moment concentrating on your equipment, uh, all the beautiful surroundings, or watching what the instructor's teaching you. Um, so that, I thought that was, uh, that was quite pertinent here. Somebody has asked me, what was your next planned diving trip? Well, who knows? <laughs> Thanks to COVID, I had many plans, as I'm sure many of you did this year, and probably won't do any of them. However, with any luck, I'm going to visit a friend in Australia in November, uh, well, I'm flying in November, and her wedding's in December. And I will almost certainly do some diving there again, but what I would really love to do is to do a liveaboard, which is, as it sounds, you live aboard a boat, and then you're able to go to sites that are further away from, from land, and they're often got less divers there. Um, they're less busy, therefore, and um, you know you get the experience of being on a boat. They are very expensive. So that's that's one of the things that, that can be expensive, but that's because you are they are facilitating you to have up to four dives a day, which is a lot. <laughs> um, so you pay for the opportunity to have those four dives a day. And if you take less, that's up to you. And of course, you've got all your food and lodging and all of that. So that can be a big outlay. So I would like to. Um, so we'll see. So that, 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 I can't remember whose question that was, but that was the next planned diving trip. And a lot of some of the world-class diving is, as I said, you have to go quite far to get to it and there's a place called the Solomon Islands that I'd love to go to that's near Australia um uh so yeah that would again it's, it's the expense of that but uh, we shall see and if not then Barry Reef or somewhere in Australia and if it works and we'll see what trial restrictions go then uh, I might try and squeeze in a little week in Egypt before that uh because in fact any time from September Egypt's great all year round but any time from September onwards, the water's really, really warm. And, you know, it's usually not school holidays. And so it's a really good time to go. Uh, Laura says, sounds amazing. Do they do those in other countries? If you ask me, is that the liverboards? Uh, yes, there's liverboards everywhere. Um, so most places with good diving will do them. I've done one for a few days. I think it's four days out on the Barrier Reef. And that, and that was really great. Um, and you, yeah, it's like anything, there's levels of cost with all of it. Um, but again, do your research, ask people if they've been to them uh, and if they've got any recommendations. So yes, liverboards all over, desperate to do them. The next question I had here was, what's the most exciting thing you've seen and where was it? 
Uh, so lots of people, as I mentioned before, lots of people like the big stuff. And uh, that's your that's your sharks and maybe large uh, turtles, manta rays, uh, huge big fish or big schools of fish. Um, and I love I love those things too. Um, I I I think I just never expected to be so blown away by actually seeing it. We've all got access to incredible TV and documentaries, and that I love watching those. Although it really makes me want to go. Um, but there's all, there's nothing like when you when you actually see it. So when I was snorkeling them, sort of free diving with the whale sharks, it, I mean, they're incredible. And um, I, mean, I just felt incredibly lucky to be there seeing that those as well. They're beautiful and they are so peaceful, but they are so huge. Um, and just being there with them, <clears throat> I didn't expect to be, it's quite emotional when you see some of the things that you've been hoping to see. And particularly because most things in the water are so graceful and they're so, you know, they're made for it and you're not. It's, it's their world, not yours. And, yeah, it's really difficult to describe it. But manta rays, definitely, I was excited. And I, I think on my Instagram, if anybody wants to see some of the pictures and things, I'm um, fowls.charlotte, if you want to go and see it, put little videos and from my trip back in uh, December and January. And you can actually hear on one of them, I think, because I've got what's called the regulator in your mouth that you use to, to take the air from the tank and uh, breathe in. You, I think you can hear me going, because I'm just so excited. And I think at one point you can hear a sort of a, <laughs> me sort of squealing with excitement into my regulator. Um, and I was just minding my own business. And then this, this manta ray out of literally the blue come, came towards me, this huge thing that's five meters wide. And it, it, it came right here and just, you know, flew over me and, and minded its own business. And, you know, I just was sort of, trying, if I could have screamed, I would have been like, look, everybody, it's amazing. That was very cool. And that's when I turned around and then there's this albino manta ray going past and, again, was blown away by that. Um, so... That was cool. I wrote a little list of things. The flock of eagle rays I mentioned, I, I, I sort of went off chasing after them. And I just couldn't, again, believe that I was seeing these things. And that was that was actually on my 40th birthday. Happy birthday to me. And uh, then I got really excited with the tiny things. So the uh, I mentioned the sea cucumbers, but when you, when you go with a good organisation and you're not learning anymore, the guide... You know, he knows these places or she knows these places like the back of their hand. They, they know where to find the things. They know the sort of um, stuff that the things will be hiding in or the, the plants that they'll be in or the coral that they'll live in. And I've seen a pygmy seahorse that was about half the size of my little fingernail. I, I mean, I would never have seen it in a gazillion years, but it, the, the diving instructor um, guide pointed it out. And to see something, you know, it's like an ant, isn't it? That, that much incredible in this in this tiniest thing that that was great and then um something called an orangutan crab and i've got a great photo of oh, it's not a great photo it's a photo of that and it's called an orangutan crab because it looks it's orange and it looks hairy <laughs> and that, so that i i thought that was extremely cool and that's only about that big um uh the squid at night time that i mentioned that was great and then just some of the coral is so stunning and so beautiful there's a site called melissa's garden in Raja and Pat and um, there was a big current once and it, we were it was like we were flying over it and just but it just went on forever just this beautiful beautiful coral garden and that's why they call them gardens I guess it's because they're just as beautiful as gardens um so I get very excited about a lot of it and surprisingly you there's, there's something they call uh, muck diving, which is when it, the visibility is less and there's, there's not so much with all the coral life and you have to look for the things a bit more. And that can be really satisfying when you suddenly see something. Um, and I believe somebody was mentioning that can be like that in the UK as well, because you have to work harder to find the stuff. Um, so, yeah, lots lots of exciting things. Um, what would Where would I like to go that I haven't already? Um, so... After speaking about the cold, I, I have this thing in my head now that I really want to try free diving in the cold water and, and diving in, in maybe in the Arctic. 
um, despite hating the cold, I, I, I'm now more confident with the rest of the diving. I'd like to try the dry suit and, and experience something like that. Um, because again, I think <clears throat> apparently there's very clear visibility in some of those places and you get a totally, it's a totally different experience. It's not necessarily top of my list, but it's up there for, for something to try. Um, and then there's a place that I wanted to go forever, which is in Borneo called Sipadan, and it's regularly listed in the top three dive sites um, in in the world. Uh, and there used to be, as an island, you used to be able to stay on it, but now because of conservation, you can't anymore. But you, it, 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 they restrict access, rightly so, and you have to get permits. So again, it's just a bit of a logistical issue to get there. You have to, everything has to line up. Um, but that that's supposed to be absolutely incredible. I would I would love to go there because I also like to combine it with a bit of uh, ex exploration of the jungle as well while I'm in Borneo, um, Micronesia, um, anywhere where it's a far far away and takes ages to get to, um, will probably be great diving um, and therefore very expensive as well because of the cost of getting there rather than the cost of diving itself. And uh, Mexico, I mean basically anywhere I haven't been. <laughs> very helpful but that's the answer um i think it was laura who asked anything super scary happen whilst diving um so this goes back to your mind and it all being about the individual so it depends what you're scared of i, I there was a, a um a woman who made a comment i think her name was carrie who said that she was part of the jaws generation so she thought she would never be into diving or anything like that because she was scared from watching jaws um, but actually did get over that, went in the water and absolutely loved it. And I think it's um, it's different for everybody. For me, I, when I was a nervous beginner and sort of freaked out a bit, I was scared I wouldn't be able to get past it, but I did. Um, and if you're not prepared and there's a strong current, that, that could feel scary, but the guides are normally great and they normally say to you, this area's got current, and they'll always jump in before you and check the current and then they'll guide the dive based on that and you know stick with the guide you'll be fine um but actually yeah currents are, are quite exciting um because you, if you you know prepare properly and know how to behave and sort of fly along um the as i mentioned going to the blue that was disorientating but i kind of stuck with the guide um and then my mind was sort of playing tricks so yeah it, it nothing super scary other than what was in my head and I've definitely been more scared snorkeling um, when like a plastic bag has touched my foot and I freaked out, <laughs> you know, it's sort of flapping around on the surface like an idiot. Uh, so yeah, I've definitely had more of a freak out when I've been snorkeling, which I, which I used to do a lot as well. Uh, and now I feel much safer diving. And I think that's because you've got that air supply and even if something happens, you know, it, your air supply is there. And if you're scared by something, you know, whereas when you're on the surface, you know, if you breathe the wrong way with a snorkel, you get water in and then you'll freak out more. So I'm much less scared. So happily not, um, not really. Just have a sip of water. Anyone else got any questions, pop them in the chat. I've just got, I've got a few more to answer. Um, what is the best kit to start out with? Um, well, as I do most of my diving in uh, warm places and as, some of you, most of you probably know, um, if you follow me on social media, I had skin cancer. So I I was really careful, I'm very fair, I always wore a really high factor sunscreen and I covered up where I could. But the best kit, if you're going to be diving, if you're going to be outside, sun protection and um, uh, some people know them as rash vests and some people know them as skins, you know, those water um, slit, uh, yeah tops basically and now I wear leggings as well and they do quite loads of great designs for, for surfers and paddle boarders and people like that now so you can get really good and you can get some cheap ones from Decathlon um, I would always recommend that you wear them rather than just going bare under your wetsuit or even if you have a shorty you know wear them as well because actually you do lose heat and you can get chilly and it adds an extra layer of warmth as well for your diving but just get some rash vests and some leggings. Stay sun safe, people. Um, so I know that's not what people are asking, but that I just have to get that in there. Um, so most people would say to start with, you know, buy yourself um, fins, snorkel and mask. Um, I bought them at times. I bought them when I was in Australia and then I sold them before I came back. Um, 
I generally hire my kit wherever I go. There's always a huge debate over what's better. If you're going to do it for a long time, then like many things, I'm sure, invest in it. And then people say, I'll encourage you to do it. But I don't know. I have not bought lots of kit. I did buy a computer once. If you did want to make an investment, that would probably be the best piece of kit because it, it logs your dives and it keeps um, a record for you. Um, uh, and you're not then having to get used to a hired computer that you know, you're not quite sure what, what it says or have to get the information on it. Um, but you, you can manage without all of it. Uh, I mean, not completely, <laughs> without owning all of it. Um, Again, go somewhere reputable, check the gear, make sure you arrive in time to get fitted for it properly and give it a check. If you're not comfortable with it, say you'd like a different mask, um, you know, yeah. I mean, having your own mask is great, but again, that can take a little while to get used to as well. So I have never bought much kit. I hire it everywhere I go and you can hire it quite cheaply. Um, I'm not saying don't buy it, but it isn't necessary. And if you want to buy a good kit, it can be really expensive. And I'm not certain that maybe other than fins and a snorkel, you, you really want to invest in secondhand kit because of, you know, your life is sort of depending on it. Uh, and if you go with a good school or a good company, you know that they have to test their kit. You know they have to service the kit. You know that that's their livelihood. Um, there's a lot of maintenance around the kit. And quite frankly, when I was starting out, I was lazy can be asked <laughs> like, I don't want to don't want to maintain my kit when I had so many other things to learn um and if I had it I would take good care of it for sure um but I didn't want to lug it around the world I didn't want to pay the extra baggage you can get extra allowance now um and I didn't have three grand to spend so I didn't I'd rather put the money I did have into a holiday and pay the higher cost and some people would say that's a waste of money but it's it, you can get it relatively cheaply and people are often doing deals on the hire as well. If you buy this, you get a hire for half price or for a certain number of euros a day. So completely up to you. Uh, but definitely, if you wanted a wetsuit, that would be a good investment. It doesn't take a much room necessarily in your stuff. And uh, you'd know what thickness you're comfortable with. Um, uh, if you get one that's short, then just wear leggings under it. You'll notice dive instructors all seem to have, no matter how warm the water, they have their own stuff, but they have a hood and like a long thing and sometimes an extra thing around their body. And it's because they do this all the time. And if they're going in four times a day, they're most likely to get chilly and you know lose heat. But um, yeah, even in the tropics, people, <laughs> some people are in their hoods and long, uh, long, long stuff and things like that. If you are going to have a long wetsuit, Definitely, there's a trick about taking a plastic bag that you will put over your foot to help your foot get into the wetsuit. If anybody is uh, does any other water sports, then you'll know that too, because the um, you've never looked so sexy as hopping around trying to get in your wetsuit, <laughs> and then someone like behind you hoofing it up. So that's all good fun. Um, so that, that's the kick question. Um, somebody said, how can I get some good underwater shots? And do I use a special phone or a camera? If you are a beginner, it is the very last thing you should worry about. Uh, even now, sometimes I deliberately leave. I just have a GoPro. You can get cases that you can put your iPhones in, but or any phone. But again, I think they get updated so often that the casing is quite expensive. Uh, I had a GoPro. I've only recently got one, and I got good shots. But it's like anything. It's about the being present, and sometimes you so like oh is the camera on as obsessed you might have missed the good stuff before <laughs> you might have gone while you're looking at the camera and if you're trying to get into it and trying to be confident just focus on being present and enjoying that and you'll get there if you want to take pictures I used to think I'd want to be into underwater photography and I still may one day there's plenty of time um, but definitely I found myself obsessed with the shot and oh have I got the good shot and did I get it right and not looking looking at that or looking at everything through the through the camera um and it's it's really satisfying when you get a good shot um but as a beginner I would say don't try for a while try and just focus on enjoying it and soaking it all up and and then again getting your buoyancy right because that actually will really affect the quality of your filming because if you're wobbling around all over the place it doesn't matter how good the subject is you're not going to get a good picture and when you get to the stage where you can sort of 
control your buoyancy well, then it's a great time to start trying out with um, photography. Uh, Nadia says, I bought a GoPro specifically to take photos diving in Thailand and ended up not using it at all. I was nervous about the dives. I hadn't been for a while. Exactly. That's exactly right, Nadia. You know, um, you, you, you may use it, you may not, but definitely being in the moment and uh, enjoying that and feeling safe is more important than the great shot. And you, you know, you've seen it. Um, and I get very sucked into that. So that's just a, a submission there from me. Um, next one, somebody asked about hair. Uh, so my hair is curly and dries out. Any products that can help? Uh, to be honest, I, I mean, when I go away, you know, my hair is much longer than this. Some people are like, oh, just cut your hair or like, yeah. That's not helpful if you don't want to cut your hair. <laughs> and also, actually, I find it having longer hair rather than that in between length is easier because you can wrap it up and stick it, you know, either under a, you get a swimming cap, maybe if you're trying to get through a tight wetsuit or put it on after. Um, or, uh, you know, people, some people wear diving hoods, also an excellent look. Um, so I've got a picture of me in one can great somewhere. Um, so, I, but with hair products, just really great conditioner i guess afterwards but if you're diving for a week and you've got long hair you can kind of like let it go i think just for a week or so but definitely products like conditioner but if you are going to be living near to where the dive sites are like when some of the remote places are on liverboard please 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 use reef friendly and environmentally friendly conditioner and shampoo that's much more important than than our hair in, in my opinion um what animals can I expect to see and any I should avoid? Well, that's kind of a bit like Helen's piece of stream because it depends where you go. Um, when this question was asked, I believe somebody talked a lot about what you can see in the UK and I believe there's quite a lot of variety there depending on the season. But where I've been, I mean, there's huge variety. I've talked already about the amount of biodiversity that there is in in, in some of the places I've been and, um, and the coral's beautiful um, and it's quite, quite good to watch the coral being alive and I'm thinking of it as something living rather than in sometimes I think it's static um there's there's so many different species of fish you know not, I wasn't necessarily into fish before I did diving but the colors are so incredible and you will find yourself in the bar later poring over a fish identification book you know sharing it with somebody else like oh I'm sure we saw that or was it that one and there you're flicking through this great big tome and there are so many and then there's another book on the other creatures and then there's another book on the crustaceans they're like mm. Is mind blowing the amount of creatures that you can see. I've spoken a bit about some of the little ones that got me excited, as well as some of the big stuff. Um, yeah, there's just, I mean, turtles are always great. I don't know anyone who doesn't like turtles. And I haven't spoken yet about some of the hand signals, but you know, diving obviously has got an underwater language because um, you, know, you can't talk, and uh, turtle is this, this is the sign for the turtle underwater. So I always like to see a turtle, that's a happy day. But again, lots of different varieties of turtles under there. Um, yeah, God, there's just so much. And stay with a guide or, you know, when especially when you're new, because they are excellent at spotting the stuff. That's what they're hired for, to look after you, but also to give you a good dive experience. They, they're desperate to find the things and show you. So yeah, if you're not too far away from them, then you won't miss it when, when something good goes by or, or when they know where something is. Um, and once you're, <laughs> once you're a bit more used to the experience, you'll get, you may get like me and get really like, oh, what can I spot? You know, it's really satisfying to be the spotter and the one that finds something before the guide or or they've gone past and missed sometimes in a, like in a crevice that you'll see the, um, uh, the, the, the lobsters, uh, you, you'll just see them just poking out or a little crab or something like that. And that's that's a, that's a good moment when you, when you find something and it's camouflaged. There are quite interesting um, things that they, they'll usually tell you what to avoid in the local area, like this, maybe this sea snake or uh, scorpion fish or something. And they'll show you what it looks like and say, stay away from it extra and, and not to touch it. And obviously you shouldn't be touching things anyway. Uh, but that some some of the stuff is amazing how camouflaged it is, and you'll just maybe see the eyes blink. Um, it's always a great day to see an octopus because they're again a lot of these things are more nocturnal, so it's it's they're, they're hiding and it's trickier to see them. Uh, so yeah, you could see anything and everything. Um, uh, yeah, what did somebody then ask? What do I see if an animal that could be dangerous? Well, the guide will usually see it first, and if you're with them 
follow their lead, stay calm. They should have been briefed to what might be around. Uh, they'd be more scared of you. Stay away from it. You know, that's listen to your guide. Ask them. They'd be the experts and touch nothing. Um, what can I do to calm my mind and therefore my body before going into the water and during the dive? Uh, we've talked already about unhappiness is when we're in, not in the present, when we're worrying in the future or regretting something. And that's definitely uh, that's definitely a concept, I'd say, embrace for diving. Um, you know, focus on being in the moment and uh, trying to avoid the worry of what, what might be. Um, the meditation helps. Long, slow breathing helps, even before you're in the water, that, that breathing that lowers the heart rate. Um, a distraction, if you're nervous before you get in the water, or reassuring yourself, checking your kit, talking to a friend, talking to the dive. Know yourself. I think that's one of the most important things that I want to get across in this. Know yourself. It's going to be your hobby or you're going to get enjoyment. You know yourself best. Don't let anyone else tell you that this is better. But know what works for you. And some other people might have some other tips on that as well. Uh, any sort of ritual, you know, checking your kit, re you know, being reassured about that. Giving yourself time and space, actually. Try and avoid situations where you're having to rush or with people rushing you. Goes back to what I said at the start, try and avoid being too British about anything and, and oh, okay, you know, and saying, okay, if it's not okay, you will not have a good dive. You know, if, if you're nervous, you need time and space to be okay with what you're about to do um, and to feel that you're going to, check your stuff and it's going to be all right and get reassured so yeah that would be my advice on that um somebody has asked what is their best aftercare after a dive mm. diving is very sociable there's lots of lovely people that you'll meet it's your you know even if you go like i've done as a single diver there's normally groups of people you can join and those people will probably say come and have a beer that's the best aftercare uh and that's definitely a great thing to do but immediately after the dive the, the deck um, pans and the, the boat crew normally give you some water, so you need to rehydrate. Um, it, you know, your body's been actually, even if you stay calm, it's been working hard. Uh, eat a snack. I always take snacks. Just good motto for life, really. Right, take a snack. Um, and yeah, stay dehydrated afterwards. Um, wrap up warm, even if it's, you're in a warm country. I always take a, a, a decent towel. Um, and decent stuff that I can put on to get warm after the dive because even if you're somewhere warm the wind might suddenly pick up and then you'll be shivering and cold and maybe not want to get back in for the next one and it depends on the size of the boat and the comfort of the facilities and what's around so take things that make you feel more comfortable um, Laura says always take a snack agreed I think this should be I might put this on my wall motto for life um, uh, what else? Uh, yes, even after a dive, when it's warm, the winds I've been cold and the winds got cold. So, um, yeah, take snacks, good aftercare, water, um, and top tips for making it nicer for yourself. If you're in doubt of if you'd be seasick or not, then take some tablets or wear one of those wristbands. Um, better to be safe than sorry, I would say. Um, uh, making it nicer for yourself. Start with where you are. Try not to compare yourself to other people. No matter, even if they're the same beginner as you and they seem better, you know, everyone's mind is different. Everyone's body is different. Um, make it nice for yourself by knowing yourself and try to ignore people who are, you know, maybe shaming you for how long you take to do something or, you know, even if they're taking the mick. Like sometimes it's good nature and sometimes it doesn't help. But uh, take things that make you feel more comfortable. And obviously sunscreen. That's uh, always important. You come off after a dive and you've been in the water. Again, just make sure you're, you're covered up again. Um, aftercare for kit, somebody asked. Well, obviously salt water is not great for any kit. So if you do have your own kit, and even if you're using a centre kit, sometimes it's great to, it, they might get you to put it in a certain place to rinse it off, rinsing it in fresh water, taking good care of it, and things like that. So yeah, salt, uh, fresh water is always great for rinsing everything, including yourself. Um, now, best places to start out. I've talked a little bit about that already, and it depends what you want to see. Um, so, again, my opinion only. Uh, lots of people would convince you otherwise or what they want. But for me, um, it really depends. So what you want to get out. If you're just desperate to get your qualification, you're going to get it anyway, uh, anywhere, then you know, whatever is most convenient for you. 
when travel's allowed, my preference would always for be for a ball because then you're you're relaxing anyway, you're on holiday. Um, and it can be actually cheaper even with a holiday, depending on where you're gonna learn and how long it's gonna take you in the UK. I mean, this you know, have researched this, there is a lot of debate about this, um, but I would always have you pay a little tiny bit more on the flight. And the qualification itself will be a bog standard price, a standard price, but then it's whatever the you know whatever the country costs are and how and the running of the centre and that that contributes to the cost. So Egypt, for example, uh, the the open water. I did not have a lot of money when I started, and for many 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 years, I mean, I didn't have a great deal of cash. But it just became something I factored in and I found out the costs and what I could afford. And then I saved up and I went with that. But it used to be that flights to Egypt were relatively cheap. And uh, even right now, the, the, the centre that I went with in September, again, really good. And they have a hotel where you, you don't have to stay there, but they, they do deals as well. So if you, you get cheap accommodation and B&B if you're staying and diving with them, um, that's quite good socially. And it's uh, 270 pounds for the open water qualification. That's to, to get qualified. Um, and you, you know, you might have equipment higher on top of that, but that's that's approximately 18 pounds a day. So that's not huge amounts. Um, but then obviously you've got your flights and holiday on top of that. But for example, when I went back in September, I think they if they were taking bookings now, the same deal would be on that. For 120 pounds more on top of the 270 you could have seven nights b and accommodation <laughs> it was really good at a really good place um and airport transport included that works out at only 18 pounds a night so it's not necessarily more expensive to go elsewhere whereas in the uk the, you're looking at a bog standard cost of you know you're not going anywhere you're not on holiday it's not warm all of those things and it's about 495 pounds just to get the qualification but again that's not to say don't do it it, it depends you know, what your preference is. Um, so, yeah, as I explained, I wanted to get my confidence up and I thought that not being able to see and being cold would actually impact me more. So I went somewhere warm with, with uh, good visibility um, so I could learn to navigate when I could actually see because it's not my strong point anyway. <laughs> so, you know, but then lots of people would say that when you learn in difficult conditions, it makes you a better diver. I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate that's a good theory. Uh, just it's up to you, whatever, whatever you want to do. Um, but that's I think that's a little bit of a myth bust of it's more expensive to do it abroad. I think you can do it in places like New York and things like that. The fish life is nothing, nothing like Egypt, but it, you can learn in other places and it can be cheaper than doing it here. When you start going further afield, much more expensive, obviously. Um, so I talked a bit to the advance. Somebody asked if I'd recommend that, and I would say yes. Um, something I would not recommend in terms of learning is there's now, Paddy is, you know, it's there to make money. It's a huge worldwide organization and it's a money-making machine and they're always coming up with courses that sound great and like you need them to be better diver. Just keep going diving with good, with a good school is what I would say. The one thing, um, I think I wrote it down. So there's something called the Paddy Scuba Diver, which is targeted at those who just want to try it and do a few other things. They don't want to spend their whole holiday diving. And so they've tapped into that mindset, but it costs almost as much as doing the full qualification. It takes less time, but you don't get as much depth. So you're not as fully qualified. Then you have to upgrade to the open water and that's almost as much again. So again, it's up to you, but if you're going to learn, go for the open water. That's That would be what I would say. Um, and then if you want to do other courses, you can, but it's not compulsory for the enjoyment. Any other, oh, somebody was asking where I'd recommend in Egypt. Um, I've uh, gone quite a few times with the Camel Dive Center. I would recommend them, really great, really great company. The company I learned with was not them, but they I don't think they trade anymore because it's a very long time ago when I learned, I think that they're, they're, they're not in business, but there are there are a lot of schools out there in Sharm El Sheikh. I haven't been to Dahab. I've heard some really great things about Dahab there. So that's another place you can learn to dive in Egypt as well. 
Uh, lastly, the last question, unless anybody wants to put some more in the chat, as somebody was asking about free diving and was Wim Hof, who's uh, a man who <clears throat> is a guru on uh, cold, uh, being able to survive in the cold and he uses a lot of breathing and meditation techniques. They asked, is he the guru on the breathing for free diving? No. He is a guru in his own method, um, but I believe that a lot of his method includes hyperventilating, which is when you learn to free dive, they say, absolutely not, do not hyperventilate. It's actually um, tricking your body uh, into a crop over it, some of its natural reflexes, which is not what you want to be doing when you are free diving. When you are free diving, you want to be listening to your body and the urge to breathe, and it's about learning the signals for that. Uh, so they will give you techniques when you learn. You can probably see them online. They're yogic ones, breathing. There's a variety of different exercises that you can do. Um, but no, Wim Hof is not necessarily for free diving. And in fact, I would say it's a totally different thing for something totally different, not free diving there. Um, so, yeah. I, I won't go into the exercises because A, I can't pronounce them uh, for free diving <laughs> and I would embarrass myself and I'm not an expert, but that you can do a lot of the breathing at home. And there's quite a lot of people I follow on Instagram and YouTube everywhere where they, they will be demonstrating breathing techniques to you as well. So that's coming to the end of all the questions that I had. Um, I hope that that's been informative. And if there's any other questions, I will hang for another few minutes and you can pop them in the chat. But in order to um, just to finish off, you know, I just say again, it's 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 all about your enjoyment. You know, um, it, try not to compare yourself to other people like in, in any uh, in any sphere, but particularly with this, everyone's different. And some people's air consumption is much more than other people's. Um, some people's enjoyment is different. Everyone will have different tools and techniques. And as with many, many things, take what is useful to you and leave what is not. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the only shoulds and musts, really, is that you uh, look after yourself, learn to ask for what you need and, um, you know, and get what you want from it. And I think... That's remember your plastic bag for your long for your long wetsuits. Remember your sunscreen. Be sun safe, everybody. Um, listen to instructors. Um, and yeah, don't don't give up if it's not you know, straight away the thing that you think it is. I had to persevere. I remember what it's like to be the beginner. So um, yeah, if I can learn, I was my my old nervous wreck, and anybody can. And then you might fall in love with it as much as I have. So last comments. Um, yeah, thanks for the info. So interesting. My pleasure. I really enjoyed talking about it. And Karen says, thank you. Really inspiring. Excellent. I'm really pleased. And yeah, don't forget in life, in diving, always take a snack. Um, and yeah, who says, thank you. Really interesting. Good. Glad you guys enjoyed it. I'll hang for another minute or two. But, um, you know, I'll just be sitting here like this in practicing silence. <laughs> unless anyone has any other questions but I'll, I'll wait for a minute and then I'll uh, see you guys online I'm on um, Instagram fowls.charlotte and yeah find me there for pictures of diving and other outdoorsy type stuff and drop me a message on there anytime if you want any uh, advice or um, or it, it just be my opinion or uh, recommendations very very happy to help out and chat some more show pictures be a dive bore there's a lot of those about <laughs> I'll try not to. Uh, thank you, Adventure Queens, for inviting me to do this. I've really enjoyed it. So it's been great. Thank you, guys. I'm going to say goodbye. There's no other questions. Bye, everyone.